Investigating the investigators. As the House inches closer to a contempt vote on Bill Barr, the Attorney General is doubling down on his decision to examine the origins of the Mueller probe. Welcome to America's News Headquarters from Washington. I'm Kristen Fisher. Nice to be with you. Welcome back yeah. to Milwaukee. It Thanks. seems like so long ago. I'm Leland Vittert. <laughs> Congressional Democrats trying to keep pressure on Barr. The Attorney General telling Fox News that the allegations that he lied to Congress is, quote, laughable. Garrett Tenney here to separate the facts from the talking points. Hi, Garrett. Yeah, Leland, uh, Bill Barr did not seem the least yeah. bit concerned. The Democrats are pushing to hold him in contempt, and he called it part of the usual political circus that's playing out. In his first interview since becoming attorney general again, Bill Barr told, that, told our own Bill Hemmer that he's been trying to get answers to questions about how the Trump-Russia probe got started, but a lot of the answers he's gotten just don't add up. And at this point, he has even more questions about what happened than when he started which is why he believes these investigations into the investigators are so important. If we're worried about foreign influence, for the very same reason, we should be worried about whether government officials abuse their power and put their thumb on the scale. And, and so I'm not saying that happened, uh, but I'm saying that we have to look at that. Many top Democrats argue that Barr is simply trying to defend President Trump with these investigations. And this morning, Congressman Jamie Raskin fired back at the attorney general's explanation. The deep state conspiracy theory, which the attorney general of the United States just advanced in that statement there, which I had not seen before, um, is a classic right wing authoritarian propaganda move. It's a kind of stab in the back thesis that there are people inside the government who started all of this and concocted it. And we know that that's an absolute fiction. The Justice Department is now overseeing a number of investigations looking into various aspects of the government's actions in the Trump-Russia probe. One of those is being conducted by the DOJ's Inspector General looking into the FBI's use of surveillance warrants on Trump associates. That report is expected to be completed within the next month, so we may start to get some answers in a few weeks, or we may just end up with a lot more questions. <laughs> yeah, well, that seems to be the theme so far. Garrett Tenney yeah. with us to start us off. Garrett, thanks. So President Trump's new immigration proposal is likely to face an uphill battle in Congress, even among the Republican Party's own ranks. And, of course, there will likely be no support from the Democrats, with Speaker Nancy Pelosi calling the plan, quote, dead on arrival. Jeff Paul joins us live with more. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Kristen. Citing an influx of migrants trying to seek asylum, U.S. Customs and Border Protection announced it's developing plans that would send thousands of migrants away from the southern border for processing. Border officials say the move would likely involve flying migrant families from border towns to cities across the country. CBP says they're looking at various locations that would house the migrants before releasing them as they wait for their immigration court hearings. While they haven't officially identified any specific locations, Florida sheriffs in Broward and Palm Beach County say they've been notified they could start receiving migrants. Is it humanitarian to break people? that have no real connection here, have no shelter here, have no way to provide for themselves from an area where at least they're being provided for now into another environment and release them with no means of transportation. To me, that's not humanitarian. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is a vocal supporter of President Trump, says he plans to fight any plans that would send migrants from the southern border to South Florida. He says Florida cannot accommodate, quote, dumping migrants into Florida. And DeSantis thinks it'll tax the state's resources, schools, health care, and law enforcement. This was not something that came down from the White House. This was something that, that came out of the agencies. Um, and, you know, sometimes this stuff, this stuff happens. And so it's going to ultimately be something I'm going to have to talk with the, with the president about. The interim Border Patrol sector chief in San Diego says right now migrants are being flown to his location from Texas. He says CBP is still considering whether or not to add flights that could include the Detroit, Buffalo, and Miami areas. Kristen. Jeff Paul, thank you. Leland? All right, pick up where Jeff Paul left off from Kansas City, Missouri, the home of Arthur Bryant's barbecue, and also the home to Democratic Congressman, member of the House Homeland Security Committee, Emanuel Cleaver. Nice to see you, sir. Appreciate you being here on a Saturday. Uh, all right, so we've got Buffalo, Detroit, South Florida on that list that you just heard from Jeff Paul. Would you be okay with adding Kansas City and Missouri to that list? Well, I think uh, most of the cities in the nation would like to be welcoming to immigrants, 
uh, provided that uh, we have the, the resources uh, to accommodate them. I'm not in support of, of um, picking up Im immigrants at the border and then taking them to cities and letting them off buses. So I think we have to have a strategy uh, and arguing is not a strategy. So I think but, we... But, but Congressman, uh, you've got, you got thousands of people coming across the border all the time. Strategy or not, you've got to have some place to put them. Now, now they're talking about building tent cities down by the border. Isn't moving them to cities around America where you can spread the burden out a better idea? Well, I, as I said, I think Kansas City and, and many other city, uh, cities would be welcoming. I certainly would be, personally. Okay and would use whatever influence I had to, to create an, a welcoming environment. I'm just saying, all of a sudden we would have uh, whatever number, thousands maybe, hundreds, and, and, and we want to be able to provide them with whatever they need to survive. Hmm. I'm not sure that without a strategy and without knowing you know, uh, in a, you know, sometime in advance for preparation, that we're going to be of an advantage to them. You, know, you, make, you, you bring up a good point. The mayor of Yuma, Arizona, has been on this program before. He says he's overwhelmed, declared a state of emergency in his city because of how many migrants uh, have come in. I want to move you to what we started the show off with, with Garrett Tenney talking about Bill Barr, the attorney general, who said that this has sort of turned into a political circus. He says he's not really worried about being held in contempt. On your side of the aisle, there's talk of a constitutional crisis. I have, is the words and language here gotten overhyped to where we're at? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I, uh, first of all, let me say I'm not a lawyer, uh, but uh, I, I can tell you that I, I think uh, there are people who probably are celebrating all the chaos. Of, no. uh, Putin is probably one of them. <laughs> but I, I, but I, do, I do think that, uh, you know, when we start, uh, I'm not sure we're in a, con a constitutional crisis. I am sure that uh, there is a, an infringement right now on the Constitution. Uh, I, I think there is uh, an impertinent response to the Constitution by the President. Hmm. And I think all of the people who are celebrating the fact that nobody is allowed to come and testify before Congress, they are essentially saying that no longer should Article 1 be a factor I, I, in our, well, in our I, lives. Well, Eric, Eric Holder was held in contempt of Congress, and uh, the Republic still there. survived. I, I was there. Yeah. The difference, of course, is, and I, the difference, of course, uh, is that I don't ever remember in our, uh, in our history where uh, uh, individuals were just prohibited from uh, testifying before Congress. Uh, and Congress I, I don't has, think Attorney General Barr has been, uh, been prohibited from testifying. In fact, he said he would testify. He just wouldn't testify and let staffers question him rather than members of Congress. That's a distinction probably on Barr's side of the equation from what Holder did, right? Well, yes. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, the, the Attorney General said he would not testify with staffers. But keep in mind, we, had, we just had a hearing uh, with a Supreme Court Justice, a Supreme Court Justice over on the Senate side, the Judiciary Committee, where a former staffer... But, but I, 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 guess, staffer, I guess my question is, we're, just to get back to the issue of the rhetoric here, we're in a constitutional crisis because the Attorney General says he won't testify in front of both staffers and committee members and ask the committee to pick one that qualifies as a constitutional crisis well i didn't use the term constitutional crisis but I, I, we do have a, a serious problem uh... because it's not just the attorney general it's the president's son it's other members who've been president's uh, son's called testifying? in even, it, even former staffers hmm. uh... who the president is saying will, will not be allowed to, to testify and so wait, wait, wait. what we're essentially, we're, we're, we're okay. emasculating the Title I uh, creation of the founders, okay. which is the Congress. Right. If we, we Congressman, I, 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 got, I got the idea. I appreciate it. Um, and come back and talk to us. As you pointed out, uh, the issue on the uh, immigration, finding places for these folks is not going away. Uh, when you start welcoming immigrants to Kansas City, let us know, and uh, we'd love to come talk to you about it. Well, unity is important, and I'm one of those yeah. people who believe that Instead of tearing the nation apart, we've got to try to figure out ways to bring us together. I think uh, Joe Biden is going to be talking about just that in about an hour and a half here when he kicks off a rally in Philadelphia. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Sure. Good to be with you. Good to see you, sir. Kristen? All right. So let's bring in the Republican side, Arizona Congressman and member of the House Judiciary Committee, Andy Biggs. Congressman, thank you for coming on. 
Thanks for having me, Kristen. So, Congressman, let's start. I want to give you a chance to respond to something that your Democratic colleague just said. He was saying that what's happening right now is an infringement on the Constitution by the President of the United States. I'm assuming you don't agree. Well, no. What he's talking about, I guess, is that Bill Barr would refuse to testify or provide documents. And, and there's, there's a legitimate oversight function that is constitutionally given to the legislative branch. But we're on a fishing expedition right now. And in fact, they, they revealed in the hearing uh, just a, a week ago that this is all about finding evidence of, so they could impeach the President of the United States. That no longer is an oversight function. If you want impeaching, you need to put your forth your resolution and then go and proceed in that way. And so it's a really different thing. And, and Representative Cleaver uh, is right in, in one sense, and that is that when Eric Holder was held in contempt, we were talking about a year and a half of uh, investigative work, an attempt to get information from Mr. Holder that he refused to give. That's a completely different thing from trying to get 1.4 million documents within less than two weeks. So it's a big issue here, but it's, not, it's certainly not uh, a constitutional crisis or an impingement on the Constitution. Well, Congressman, Democrats really want the special counsel himself to come on Capitol Hill and testify publicly. Do you want Bob Mueller to testify? Oh, yeah, there are things I would like to ask Bob Mueller, absolutely. I want to talk about the, the instigation of the, uh, the Mueller investigation, the Russia investigation, uh, how we got the, the FISA abuse. Uh, and, and Mr. Mueller knows all that, but it wasn't revealed in his report. I'd like to talk to him about that. And then some other areas that were not will? in his report as well. Do you think he will uh, come testify? Because obviously there was talk that he would come on May 15th. That didn't happen. Now we're hearing possibly sometime in June. Do you think he will come? Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Okay. <laughs> That's a nice, concise <laughs> I, answer. I wasn't, wasn't expecting such a short answer. I appreciate that. <laughs> Don't usually get that. Uh, let's talk about immigration. You know, the Trump administration is considering sending uh, some of these migrants at the border to yep. other cities. Uh, I know you're pretty close to the border in Arizona, right. but I'm curious if you would be comfortable with some of these migrants being transported to your district. Well, believe it or not, they're already being uh, transported to uh, the Phoenix metro area, uh, thousands of them. And I got a kick out of uh, uh, Representative Cleaver saying, you know, we, we just need some time. We just need some time to get this stuff together before we can uh, do this in, in our city, in, in Kansas City. But think about this. What you've got going on is we are overrun in, the, in Arizona as a border state. Yuma can't handle it. Otero County, New Mexico can't handle it. And we don't get that breather to get ready for it. We are seeing hundreds released into uh, our state every day and literally 4,000 people crossing the southern border every day. And so you would be okay with more of them coming into your district. I uh, just no, wanted heavens, to make sure no, that's clear. We, no, Kristen, we can't, we can't handle it. I mean, that's the point. And, and, and that's what ICE and Border Patrol is saying. Uh, the border states are being overrun and really don't even have facilities. Uh, they're trying to find more facilities in Maricopa County, but, but the churches, the NGOs, City of Phoenix has even told us they don't have any more resources. The City of Phoenix is a big city, the metro area is about 5 million people, and we're, we are overtaxed. And so we need to spread this out throughout the country, and we also need to take care of the border and, and secure that border. Really quick, I just want to ask you about the immigration plan that President Trump put forward earlier this week. I know you support it or large parts of it, but a lot of your Republican colleagues do not or have at least been very tempered in their uh, enthusiasm when they're talking about it. So I, I'm curious, do you think there's room for movement here? Are people like you, President Trump, uh, could they convince some Republicans to, to get behind it? Yeah, I think I think there is. I uh, you know I th I don't know anybody who's not uh, for find, finding people and letting people in that are going to be the most uh, uh, helpful to this country. But especially because he keeps um, familial relations, those still there's a significant portion of people who can come in that way. I think there's some movement. I think there's some negotiation to be had. I view this as a first step. Uh, and I just don't, I just don't, my only issue is I don't want this discussion of legal immigration right. to distract from uh, illegal immigration problems. So maybe some, some movement with Republicans, the Speaker Pelosi says it's dead on arrival. So Congressman Biggs, yeah, I got to leave it there. Thank you. Leland. Thanks, Kristen. Well, the U.S. has issued a new warning to commercial airliners amid rising tensions with Iran, saying that planes flying over the Persian Gulf run the risk of being, quote, misidentified. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin with us on this ominous warning. 
Absolutely. Ominous warning. A senior Trump administration official, Leland, briefed reporters last night suggesting the crisis is far from over. This is an incredibly serious situation, he said. We take it seriously, and I can assure you they, the Iranians, should too. With the USS Abraham Lincoln now in the Gulf, U.S. officials say they have seen signs Tehran is getting the message. Some of the missiles that they say Iran had loaded onto at least two ships have been removed. That, according to defense officials. Meantime, foreign passport holders working with ExxonMobil have started evacuating an oil field in Basra in southern Iraq, which follows the ordered evacuation of U.S. embassy personnel from the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. The warning to commercial airliners flying over the wider Persian Gulf is a grim reminder that 30 years ago, the USS Vinson mistook an Iranian passenger jet for a warplane, killing all 290 people aboard. The Vinson was protecting commercial ships in the Strait of Hormuz when the incident occurred. President Trump pushed back on news reports that he is angry with his national security team. And they put out so many false messages that Iran is totally confused. I don't know. That might be a good thing. The president has offered to negotiate with the Iranians a message delivered through the Swiss who represent the U.S. in Tehran. The U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal exactly a year ago and listed Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist group last month, raising fears in Baghdad that Iraq could become the site of a proxy war between the U.S. and Iran. Secretary of State Pompeo reportedly told Iraqi leaders, you're either with us or stand out of the way. Lawmakers, some lawmakers received a classified briefing from U.S. security officials on Friday explaining the intelligence that led U.S. national security officials to believe Iran was preparing to strike U.S. forces using proxy forces in Iraq and placing those missiles on board ships. The full House and Senate will be briefed by Secretary of State Pompeo, Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan, and General Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs on Tuesday, Leland. What are your sources telling you about this intelligence that the Iranians were looking for a preemptive strike on U.S. interests? Well, I can tell you that the military believes that they had several threat streams. Uh, the request to move the Abraham Lincoln and to send those B-52 bombers, which they did in 50 hours, they mobilized them in 50 hours from Louisiana to the Gulf. That's a very quick movement for the U.S. military. Uh, the U.S. Central Command believed they had several threat streams, including some conversations with Qasem Soleimani that had been intercepted telling proxy groups, right. Shia groups, to attack in Iraq. And these satellite yeah. photos that have not been declassified, but which they claim show the Missiles, missiles on board. At the same time, you make the point that you move B-52s within 50 hours. The Abraham Lincoln moves, but that was only two weeks early. All the things that the U.S. military is not doing. We're not seeing a massive buildup in the in the Middle East. You don't see ships heading over with divisions of tanks. You don't see C-17s lined up at Fort Bragg sending the 101st and Delta Force over there. None of these things are happening. Well, there are certain things that we don't see that are happening in terms of preps, but you're right. Even the leak of that 120,000 troops going to the Middle East, that was really uh, floated out there to give a sense that we're serious. You, you really have a sense, I think, as a Pentagon reporter right now, that we are being used as part of the messaging. <laughs> and so uh, what the reality is, I do believe that the, the military themselves believe that they saw uh, worrying signs. Was that a misread on the part of the Iranians, thinking that the U.S. was about to strike? There are some reports this week that, that this, is, uh, this was miscommunication yeah. and that the intelligence has been a bit confused. But what I can tell you is that it doesn't seem like uh, the tension is ratcheting down, given some of the statements from the White House in the last 24 hours. At least not yet. We'll watch it through the weekend. Jennifer Griffin, thanks so much. Kristen? Vice President Joe Biden is set to speak at a rally in the city of brotherly love in less than an hour. We'll take you there live down to Philly right ahead of his remarks. Uh, on the campaign trail, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1222 Eastern, awaiting former Vice President Joe Biden, who's going to kick off his first campaign rally in the city of brotherly love, united there on the screens. Perhaps a preview of the Vice President's, the former Vice President's message. Brian Yenis standing by as the crowd fills in there, though, perhaps not as big of a crowd as the Vice President might have liked. 
Hi, Leland. Well, the crowd is still coming in here. We're uh, in downtown uh, Philadelphia. He's expected to speak in about an hour. I will say this. This is a very uh, fitting setting for the former vice president. He was born just two hours away from Philadelphia in Scranton, Pennsylvania. This is, of course, the birthplace of American democracy. And also what he's really doing is sending a message that he is the candidate that can win those voters that went over to President Trump in 2016. Those blue collar, working class folks who voted for the president. And he thinks by proving to folks that he can win Pennsylvania, he can win those folks back. Take a look at this latest Quinnipiac poll. It shows that the former Vice President Joe Biden has a double-digit lead over President Trump here in Pennsylvania, 53 percent to 42 percent, and that is the largest lead of any of the Democratic contenders. We have uh, with me actually here, back here in downtown Philadelphia, just moments before the Vice President speaking, this is Senator Chris Coons of Delaware U, uh, holding the seat that the Vice yep. President had held for, for so many years. Explain to me what you think we can, what you expect to hear from the vice president, uh, former vice president? Well, I expect we're going to hear from Joe Biden uh, a very optimistic, a very positive um, message about his campaign and how he really hopes to bring back the strength of the middle class here in Pennsylvania and across our whole country. As you mentioned, Brian, in the introduction, uh, we know him initially as Scranton Joe, then Delaware's Joe, then our, vi then our nation's vice president, uh, and now I think as the most compelling candidate for president uh, on behalf of my party, the Democratic Party. Already, we are seeing shots from other progressive candidates. They are going after uh, Biden. There's this thought that, really, he's not progressive enough to win in this election. What do you say to those folks who say he, he's too moderate? He's got a remarkable record of actual accomplishment. Uh, Joe Biden knows more world leaders and has more actual personal experience in global affairs and uh, in foreign policy than any other candidate running for president. Um, he's someone who served as vice president for eight years, and I know he'll be running on the record of the Obama-Biden administration. Uh, for those who say that's not progressive enough, um, I'd ask what they were able to accomplish so far. Um, some of them have served as long as he has, uh, and yet can't point to the same sorts of accomplishments uh, uh, whether it's in advancing LGBTQ rights, in combating climate change, or in making access to health care more affordable and higher quality. I think Joe's got a great record to run on, and I think we'll end up seeing him as the Democratic candidate in the general election. Lots of talk here about vice presidential picks. Uh, there was a talk about people talking about Kamala Harris, the senator from California, being a great VP pick for Mr. Biden. She, of course, shot back, uh, saying that Biden would make a great VP pick for her. What do you make of all of this? Is it too early? And do you think Harris is a good VP pick? Uh, it is far too early. And Senator Harris, whom I um, respect as a colleague on the Judiciary Committee, is quite good. Uh, she's very agile. I thought that was a terrific turn of phrase on her part. Um, it is way too early to be talking about who is whose running mate. Um, polls will come. They'll go. They'll go up and down. Uh, as President Trump learned in uh, his race for the presidency, um, there were lots of times when certain candidates were counted in, counted out, and things ultimately turned out differently than they were initially expected to. Um, I think Joe Biden will be a strong candidate through this entire race, um, but I don't think it's uh, time yet for us to talk about any other candidates joining him on a future ticket. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator Coons. Very much appreciate it. Leland, uh, you heard it there. Senator Coons, who was one of the first to endorse the former vice president, and he's about to speak in just a few moments. All right. Leland. Part of his speech, we're hearing uh, the vice president, former vice president, to say that he will be a president for everyone. Talk about unity versus anger. Back to, back to Philadelphia when the vice president takes the stage. Brian Yenis there in Philadelphia. Brian, thanks. President Trump lifting steel and aluminum tariffs on Canada and Mexico, moving to ease tensions as the president's trade war with China faces a very uncertain future. So for more insight, let's turn to former assistant U.S. trade representative during George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton's administrations and senior international trade advisor at Miller and Chevalier Law Firm. Well, Zor. Thank you so much for providing your insight. I want to start by just talking about uh, Joe Biden because he made some pretty controversial comments about two weeks ago saying that he believed that China was not big competition for the United States, that it was uh, not a threat to the U.S. economy. And both Republicans and Democrats really pushed back on the former VP about this. Uh, your thoughts? I think, uh, I, I think I know where uh, former Vice President Biden's coming from, which was um, a, a different take than the Trump administration's taken with respect to the uh, trade negotiations. Uh, but China, China is the big 600-pound gorilla for taking on our economy, and hence the reason why the President, President Trump's administration is taking these 301 actions uh, and pressing the Chinese for a trade deal. 
So we saw the attempt to make a trade deal kind of fall apart. Then President Trump said that he's going to be meeting with the Chinese President Xi Jinping in Japan at the G20 in late June. He also said this week that he believes that he will be able to tell the American people if he's been able to reach a deal with China in about three to four weeks. Is that a realistic time frame? I think it's a realistic possibility. Okay. Um, I think we're just coming off a roller coaster week of trade developments with the 232 announcement right. uh, from last night and then um, the the whole idea that uh, well we thought we had a China deal a week almost a week ago and yet uh, the administration's made very clear we're going to be back at the negotiating table as early as next week. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm optimistic that that three week to four week time frame up to the G20 is uh, a time frame that they could possibly reach a deal. Well, I know that's good news yes. that you think that for all of the farmers and other companies that are really feeling the pinch, but now a lot of companies are saying that we're almost at that point where it's really going to be felt, these tariffs are really going to be felt by the consumers, Macy's and Walmart coming out. I want to just pop up a statement from Walmart CFO who said this, increased tariffs will increase prices for consumers. And that kind of contrasts something that President Trump tweeted earlier this week. He said there's no reason for the U.S. consumer to pay the tariffs which take effect on China today. That's what he said when the tariffs went into effect. So, so, so which, it, which is it? Are our consumers going to, you know, who, who's going to pay this? Consumers will pay the increased costs because what the, what the tariffs are, in effect, are mm -hmm. taxes. And uh, tariffs um, hit consumers because uh, producers uh, raise costs when they are hit with paying those higher taxes at the border. And that's just the reality. Um, what, I, what I fear uh, is that the next tranche of tariffs that may go into effect as early as July, the, four, the tranche four tariffs, uh, would be the most detrimental because they will hit what I like to call the big box store, mm. having the big box store effect, which is um, all consumer items in those big box stores will be subject to the hike in 25% tariffs if they go into effect. And that would be happening right around the time that parents and families are doing Precisely. all their back-to-school shopping. Yes. Those consumers would definitely feel it. All they right. will feel it through, through July, through the summer, and into the fall. Yes, well, Zorba, let's hope it doesn't. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, but we appreciate your predictions nonetheless. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Leland. Well, great conversation there. We check back in Philadelphia as we await former Vice President Joe Biden. We'll see if he mentions tariffs, China, and the American dream. Break down his message when we come back. All right, live pictures back to Philadelphia as we await the former vice president. A nod to his slogan or perhaps his messaging on those big jumbotrons. United is his message. We'll see how uh, that plays across the country. To talk about it, Michael Knowles, host of the Michael Knowles Show. show. Uh, on podcasts, wherever you listen, dailywire.com, other places known for greatness to listen to Mr. Knowles. Uh, the last time you were with us, Michael, you were talking about uh, Julian Castro, who was announcing uh, his run that day, and you said uh, that that announcement was about as significant as what you had for breakfast. Uh, we'll, let, we'll let the viewers decide uh, how true your prognostications were. What do you think of the vice president's race? Perhaps a little bit more significant than your breakfast order? I think, unfortunately, much more significant than my breakfast order. By the way, I think my prediction was correct, because until you just said his name, I had forgotten that Julian Castro was running for president oh. at this point. Joe Biden, however, poses a significant threat to the president. Forget the national polls. When you look at the individual polls yeah. in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, he's up between 8 and 10 points over Donald Trump. If the election were held today, Joe Biden would win it, possibly in a landslide. And you, you know, it's almost like we, it's almost Trump, like we plan this segment because we actually have one of those polls from Pennsylvania, uh, the vice, former vice president's home state, uh, and he is up by almost 10 points depending on which poll you look at over President Trump. What has happened to all the blue collar voters uh, that flipped from Obama to Trump now flipping back to Biden? Where is the where has the Republicans lost their way on this? 
Well, Joe Biden is going into this race right now looking pretty clean. He's been out of politics for a few years. Nobody has really been attacking him for anything other than giving people back massages and smelling their hair. So he's going in with some advantage. Nobody has hit him on his actual weaknesses. He's uh, a liar. He's something of an unctuous, smiling politician. So they can hit him on not having a whole lot of substance. He's somewhat corrupt. You, there is significant corruption in some of his son's dealings. Uh, and influence but peddling I, I, in China I, and Ukraine? I, I would say uh, significant allegations. I'm not sure any of them have been proven yet. The, the, the going Fair thought, enough. though, in, in politics is you don't hit somebody on their weaknesses. You hit them on their strengths. Joe Biden's strength is the idea of being able to connect to the middle class, the guy who rides Amtrak to and from Delaware, the guy who can talk to folks in an ice cream store better than just about anybody else. His message, we're told, when he takes the stage, is going to be as a president for everyone. He's already framing this as Biden versus Trump, not even talking about the nomination uh, for the Democratic uh, Party. Do you feel as though that's a little premature, or should everyone just sort of get ready to get the graphics going of Biden versus Trump? Certainly it's premature. There are 22 other candidates in this race. There will probably be another 22 before the whole thing is over. Uh, I do agree, though, people, that you, you want to hit him on his connection to voters. The other strength that he's been campaigning on is that he has so much experience. He's been in politics for 50 years. He, he's been in office since he was 26 years old. And I think this is the real place that eventually mm -hmm. President Trump could hit him on if he wins the nomination, oh. which is that in all of those 50 years, Joe Biden does not have a banner accomplishment to his name. He's been in office for 50 years. What has he done? Donald Trump's been in, two, in office for two years. He's had a relative very successful presidency. I think that's where you'll be able to see the distinction. Well, and also it, it seems as though the president is laying out trying to draw this distinction on China. We keep hearing China, China, China from President Trump and we know Vice President Biden has downplayed uh, that before. Mr. Knowles, we appreciate it and we will uh, check these prognostications the next time we uh, have you on to see if you're still batting uh, 100. <laughs> good to see you, Leland. Good to Sounds see good. you, sir. All right, thanks. Be sure to catch Fox News Sunday tomorrow. Chris Wallace has an exclusive interview with 2020 presidential candidate, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. Check your local listings for time and channel. Plus, Chris is going to moderate a town hall with Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. That's tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern. You do not want to miss this. It's going to be fascinating. Howard Kurtz is going to take a look at how the media is covering the 2020 field tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern. A dangerous load of ammo gets detonated near a busy California highway. The full story when we come back. Hey, there it goes. Friday, bomb squads blew up the live ammunition from an F-16 fighter jet that crashed through the roof of a warehouse in southeast Los Angeles. The crash happened one day earlier. The pilot reported hydraulic problems, you can see the hole in the warehouse, and lost control of the aircraft. There were no serious injuries, and we're told the pilot is in good condition. Wow. So Boeing is now saying that it has completed that software update for its 737 MAX planes in the wake of a congressional hearing with the acting FAA administrator about the aircraft. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Rob Mark. He's a commercial pilot, senior editor at Flying Magazine, and the publisher of Jetwine.com. Mark, Rob Mark. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Rob, so Thanks. let's start with what Boeing is saying. They say that they have fixed this software update. Uh, is that going to be enough, though, to get the FAA to clear the MAX 737 to go back up and fly again? Oh, not by a long shot. I mean, for one thing, FAA is going to be extremely cautious this time because they're already under a lot of pressure from Congress that they may have uh, given uh, Boeing a little bit too much leeway in the early stages of the development of this airplane and there's worldwide pressure on Boeing and the FAA to to make sure this is really going to fix the problem and so you know in addition to the software issues some members of Congress during this hearing this week were, were very critical of the training for the pilots and some of the pilots themselves in fact they blamed the pilots some lawmakers for the Ethiopian and Indonesian crashes uh, do you agree with that line of thinking 
Not really. I, I think what we always find is, is in an accident, it's, it's not usually one event. It's a chain of events. Uh, yes, the pilots were there in the airplane uh, trying to wrestle control of the airplane back. Uh, you know, but again, they're not here to defend themselves. But again, it's, it's only a piece of the puzzle. We didn't even know that this MCAS system that went crazy even existed until after the, uh, mm. the Lion Air crash last year. There were just so many concerns that were brought up this, in this hearing, and I want to share uh, one more of them with you and then get your take on the other side of it. It's from Congressman Sam Graves of Missouri. Listen to this. That's what scares me in all of this, is climbing on an aircraft or an airline um, you know, that, is, that is outside U.S. Uh, jurisdiction. I know what we have in the U.S., and I know what we are capable of, and I know the, the quality of our pilots and the quality, what they have to go through um, to get to that point. So he's essentially saying that, you know, he potentially someday would be fine with getting on planes that are checked and certified and, you know, checked out by the FAA, but not so much getting on flights that, you know, are, are originating from outside the United States. Is that a legitimate concern in your mind? Well, I think everybody that, that's involved in aviation knows that the training and the uh, regulation of uh, U.S. carriers, uh, Western Europe, uh, Australia, uh, parts of Asia are absolutely top-notch. They're the same. Uh, but there are places in the world that have, uh, uh, you know, less than spectacular uh, safety records. Uh, there's some of the traffic in Africa, some parts of Asia. Uh, but again, that's, that's the regulation on a local basis. Uh, I think we all just have to kind of, you know, look at, at the airline we're thinking about flying on and not simply choose the cheapest when we're outside of our region of comfort. So here we go, heading into Memorial Day weekend, the start of the busy summer travel season. How much is this, the grounding of all these planes, going to impact travelers? Or has that, that loss already sort of been absorbed by the airlines? Oh, I think it's going to have a, an effect. I mean, just in the last month, I mean, I've been on two different airlines and I've had two different flights just canceled at the last minute. Uh, it takes some scrambling, uh, but unfortunately, if you want a system that's safe, that stays safe, and we know we have some weaknesses right now that we're trying to address, we're just going to have to put up with it. Yeah, I think folks are, ca folks are okay with uh, a few delays if it means staying safe. Uh, Rob Mark, thank you so much. You betcha. Leland. The FBI's new push to track down fugitive cop killers. We'll be right back. America. Hey, there it goes. Friday, bomb squads blew up the live ammunition from an F-16 fighter jet that crashed through the roof of a warehouse in southeast Los Angeles. The crash happened one day earlier. The pilot reported hydraulic problems. You can see the hole in the warehouse and lost control of the aircraft. There were no serious injuries, and we're told the pilot is in good condition. Wow. So Boeing is now saying that it has completed that software update for its 737 MAX planes in the wake of a congressional hearing with the acting FAA administrator about the aircraft. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Rob Mark. He's a commercial pilot, senior editor at Flying Magazine, and the publisher of Jetwine.com. Mark, Rob Mark, thank you for coming on. Uh, Rob, so Thanks. let's start with what Boeing is saying. They say that they have fixed this software update. Uh, is that going to be enough, though, to get the FAA to clear the MAX 737 to go back up and fly again? Oh, not by a long shot. I mean, for one thing, FAA is going to be extremely cautious this time because they're already under a lot of pressure from Congress that they may have uh, given uh, Boeing a little bit too much leeway in the early stages of the development of this airplane and there's worldwide pressure on Boeing and the FAA to to make sure this is really going to fix the problem and so you know in addition to the software issues some members of Congress during this hearing this week were, were very critical of the training for the pilots and some of the pilots themselves in fact they blamed the pilots some lawmakers for the Ethiopian and Indonesian crashes uh, do you agree with that line of thinking 
Not really. I, I think what we always find is, is in an accident, it's, it's not usually one event. It's a chain of events. Uh, yes, the pilots were there in the airplane uh, trying to wrestle control of the airplane back. Uh, you know, but again, they're not here to defend themselves. But again, it's, it's only a piece of the puzzle. We didn't even know that this MCAS system that went crazy even existed until after the, uh, mm. the Lion Air crash last year. There were just so many concerns that were brought up this, in this hearing, and I want to share uh, one more of them with you and then get your take on the other side of it. It's from Congressman Sam Graves of Missouri. Listen to this. That's what scares me in all of this, is climbing on an aircraft or an airline um, you know, that, is, that is outside U.S. Uh, jurisdiction. I know what we have in the U.S., and I know what we are capable of, and I know the, the quality of our pilots and the quali what they have to go through um, to get to that point. So he's essentially saying that, you know, he potentially someday would be fine with getting on planes that are checked and certified and, you know, checked out by the FAA, but not so much getting on flights that, you know, are, are originating from outside.